Today, uh, the, the theme is complexity. And this is something that we talk about quite often, and it's something that we see um, all the time. And it's got to be one of the biggest reasons why we have to do MBSE. And that's really what I want to talk about today is the nature of complexity and how it manifests and very importantly, how it's evolved over the um, over the years. We'll be looking at a simple example and we'll just be really sort of talking around that and explaining why complexity has is, is, is increased, has is shifted, has evolved and so on. So to begin with then, uh, ultimately, why are we talking about complexity in the first place? Well, if you, if you look at, if we go back slightly further and, and think, why do we need systems engineering in the first place? And there's many books on this and there's many discussion points. But one of the things that I think it really comes down to is in the real world, um, when we're working on real projects and when we're interacting with real systems and when we're utilising real systems, it's very, very easy for things to go wrong. And, and I think to keep it very simple, if, if things didn't go wrong, we wouldn't really need systems engineering. Uh, but things do go wrong. And what we need to consider is why things go wrong. And again, if you look at the literature, if you look at the books, there's many reasons why things go wrong. And Simon and I have been referring to these for the last 20 years or so as the, the three evils of systems engineering. And these are complexity. And by that, we mean unmanaged, uncontrolled, unidentified complexity in the system, uh, poor communications, um, and a lack of understanding. Now, today we're going to focus on complexity. We will have uh, subsequent talks looking at some of these other uh, some of these other evils as well. But today we're going to focus on complexity on the whole, okay? And really just try and get a handle on exactly what do we mean by complexity and how it really impacts what we do and why we need to think about things like modeling and MBSE to help us cope with that complexity. So when we look at complexity, if we just consider um, a basic system. Um, now, this is where I get to try out the drawing tablet. Uh, if we look at, uh, let me choose a different color, a basic system. And the obvious place where complexity occurs is within that system at the system level, but also within the system elements we have to bear in mind. We also have to bear in mind that stakeholders bring with them their own complexities. So when we think about any of these entities, uh, such as systems that comprise the systems and stakeholders, each of them is going to have their own, if you like, inherent level of complexity. Now, that's relatively well understood. Most people will, will uh, be able to identify with that, that systems have their own inherent complexity. But what's very important when it comes to systems engineering, and if we think about systems thinking, and systems thinking being about, well, not thinking about things in isolation, but actually thinking about the way that they relate to one another and the dependencies between the different elements in our system, we also have to bear in mind that complexity will often manifest itself here on the relationships between various things. And that's one of the areas that we we can really um, we can really apply our modelling and our, our MBSE is helping to identify what are the relationships between things and therefore if we have a relationship what are the potential interactions that we have between things and this is one of the big areas where complexity manifests itself but also one of the areas that people tend not to um, tend not to think about complexity so if we consider some sort of system. So for example, um, we've just got three elements in this system, which I'm just going to refer to as A, B and C. Um, now these, these could be anything really, these could be systems in themselves, they could be subsystems, they could be different stakeholders, uh, it doesn't really matter what they are, they, they could be processes, they could be requirements. Um, for the sake of the discussion, let's just imagine that these are requirements, so A, B and C are a requirement. And let's imagine, no, I don't want to bring the whole session down so early on, but let's imagine that somebody's using doors or a tool like that for their uh, requirements. And we've got a, a number of objects in there or a number of requirement definitions in there, one called A, one called B and one called C. Now, the problem that we have as 
writing things down as lists as it seems intuitive because when we start to write things down naturally we have to write in a linear fashion we tend to start at the top of the page and work our way down and go left to right okay what is actually very difficult to perceive when we're just looking at text and we're just looking at lists are the relationships between things and it's very important that we can identify these relationships because we can read a we can read b and we can read c and we can have a good understanding of each of those elements of A, B and C. But the problem that we then face is that because we understand these things in isolation, we then make the assumption that we understand the system as a whole or the set of requirements as a whole. And this actually looks very simple. A, B and C doesn't get much simpler than that, but I can make it more complex because what I can do, I can, I can add on relationships between these elements, in this case, between these requirements, like so. And immediately the diagram has become more complex. Um, I can add on more relationships again. And again, it's increased the complexity of what I'm looking at. And I can take this to extremes now. And we end up with something that looks like that, which is quite horrible. Um, now, this might seem like an extreme example, but we see this all the time. And Simon, I see examples of this all the time where people have, have managed to hide the complexity from themselves while simply not considering the relationships between different things. And that's one of the main things that we, we need to be looking at when we're talking about modelling, when we're applying our systems engineering, is not just thinking about things in isolation, but actually thinking about the relationships between them and therefore the potential interactions between them. Now, one of the things that people often say at this point is, well, I did understand A, B and C, but now I've started identifying relationships between them. I no longer uh, understand it. It's become more complex. Now, it actually hasn't become more complex. All we've done by identifying these relationships is actually made the complexity clear. We visualised the complexity. And in almost all cases, that complexity was already there, but we just hidden it from ourselves. We haven't been able to perceive that complexity. So one of the first things that we need to do when it comes to complexity is try and identify where that complexity lives. And that's one of the big areas that modelling can help us with. Now, when we talk about complexity, there are two major types of complexity or two very broad categories of complexity. We have what we call essential complexity and accidental complexity. So when we talk about essential complexity, that's complexity that lives in the essence of the system. So it's inherent in the system. So if you like, you can think of that as almost, um, you know, we can't really do anything about that. It's the natural complexity of a system or a system element. Um, so we can't actually reduce it, but what we can do is we can identify where that complexity lives and then we can actually minimise our interactions and minimise our dependencies with that complexity. And that's something that we can explore with model based systems engineering. The other type of complexity is what we refer to as accidental complexity. And that is our fault. That isn't the natural complexity or the essential complexity of our system. This is the complexity that we've introduced ourselves through our own people, through our own processes and through our own tools. And that we certainly can minimise. We certainly can reduce that complexity. But of course, in the same way, we can't do anything about that complexity unless we can identify it in the first place. So the first step in either of these, when we talk about complexity, is simply to identify where the complexity lives and then see what we can do about it. Now, when we talk about complexity and people will often say, well, the, the world has become more complex as time goes on, the world's become more complex. Yes, of course, the world has become more complex. But what exactly do we mean by that? So this is something I want to explore on the next few slides then, is this idea of evolving complexity. Because over the last um, 
few decades, certainly over the last 50 years, we can actually see the complexity has changed. In some cases, it's just increased, but we've got to look at why that's increased. But we also see that the nature of our systems has changed, and therefore that's led to a change in the complexity. So let's consider this. This is uh, one of the first cars that I owned. Uh, I would say I didn't have it from new before everybody starts speculating about my age. Was a was a, a Triumph Herald, a 1970 Triumph Herald. This is actually uh, not a Triumph Herald, uh, but I couldn't find a picture of the actual uh, Triumph Herald. So this is this is close enough anyway. This is the uh, this is the Vitesse, but it's essentially it's the same vehicle. It's a beautiful, beautiful old vehicle. Um, if you compare that to a modern vehicle that looks something like that. Uh, 50 years later, there's a number of things that are the same about these two systems if we consider the car as our system. Now, one of the things that's the same is the basic need for a car. The basic need for a car is to take people from A to B. Okay. Um, the Triumph Herald on the left-hand side from 1970 would occasionally meet one or both of those basic needs. The car on the right, so that's actually a Citroen, the modern Citroen, will actually achieve both of those far, far more successfully than the one in 1970 did. But the basic need is the same. The human interface with the car, the way that we interact with the car, has also remained the same. We basically have a steering wheel, a gear stick and three pedals. So that hasn't really changed either. So in the last 50 years, the basic need for the system has changed and the basic interface with the system have changed. But you can't really compare this, those two vehicles outside that, because something that has changed has been the complexity of these two vehicles. So that's something that we're going to consider now in a few different ways. So first of all, let's consider the system elements that make up a, 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 that particular system. So if we look on the left hand side, we got this same idea of the system is basically it's a set of interacting system elements. However, when we look at the car from 1970, all the, all the elements on that car are uh, mechanical or electrical and that's it. So therefore the interactions on that on that particular system, on that particular vehicle, are either mechanical to mechanical, uh, electrical to electrical, or mechanical to electrical. So all the complexity on that car is essentially mechanical or electrical because of the nature of the system elements. Okay, If we compare that with a modern car, and, then, and again, this we're not intending to show every single different type of system element that can exist but there's two major types of system element that have come into play in the last few decades that we simply didn't have in 1970 and these are things like electronic system elements and software okay if i look back at my triumph herald and i look at the electrical system it had a starter motor it had headlights and windscreen wipers and that was really it OK, there was really nothing else at all on that system. I mean, there were no electronics, for example, and there was certainly no software on that uh, on that system. If you compare that to a modern vehicle now where we've got literally hundreds of different nodes dotted around the vehicle, we've got controller area networks, we've got intelligent sensors, we've got all these different very complex elements in themselves. And then we've also got software controlling all those elements. Then what we're starting to see is that the complexity is increasing because of the not just the number of system elements that we have, but also the very nature of those system elements, because what was purely mechanical and electrical is now monitored and controlled by electronics and ultimately by software as well. OK, so that's one of the first things that we need to bear in mind is that the um, the complexity is increased because of the nature of system elements that we have there. So, Simon, have you got anything to add at this point? Um, only in as much as when we start thinking um, of more and more connected systems as well, you've also got the complexity of all of the things outside the vehicle that's starting to come. Yeah, out. yeah, and we, we, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But yeah, and, that, and that's the thing, isn't it? Is it, the boundary of the of the system has yeah. also changed. Well, they're they're blurring, aren't they? It's not. It, yeah. There's not even a definitive boundary anymore. They're, they're becoming very, very blurred. Yeah. 
Okay. So if we just look at examples of this on the left hand side there, that's the why that is the complete wiring diagram for a 1970 Triumph Herald. That's it. So as I said, headlights, indicators, starter motor and windscreen wipers. And that is really, really, you know, that is genuinely the entire diagram. Right. And as we've just been saying, look at all these different sensors now that we've got on here. Look at the uh, different controller area networks and things like that we have going around the car. We've got interactions, as Simon has been saying, with the outside world. We've got GPS. We've got all these different um, uh, different communication systems sat in there. So not just the number of elements, but the nature of these elements has changed. And that's led to a, quite a large, well, a massive exponential increase in the complexity as time's gone on, particularly in the last sort of 10 years or so we've, we've seen this. Now, another thing that's changed quite dramatically has been the, the constraints uh, on our system, because as we said previously, um, the basic need for the car hasn't really changed is to get people from A to B. Um, but what has changed are the stakeholders' uh, expectations and therefore the constraints that we're having uh, that, that are being put on our system. So, for example, not that many years ago, certainly when I was younger, if I saw an advert for a car on the television, um, the main selling points of the car would be speed and, and horsepower, and it can get you from uh, 0 to 60 in seven seconds and things like that. Cars aren't really advertised like that anymore. The way that cars are advertised now is it gives you a driving experience. It's environmentally friendly. It's good for the kids in the back. It's comfortable. It's safe. It's secure. All these different aspects that, that have come in that we didn't really have uh, back in the day. So if we look at my, just for example, the safety, if we just consider that as one of the constraints, um, the thing you can see on the left is a, is a seat belt that we used to have in the front of the Triumph Herald. And it's like one of the ones you get on an aeroplane. It doesn't even have, have the shoulder strap, okay? It's a lap belt, and that that was the safety. That and the fact it was built out, it was built out of very thick, uh, very heavy steel. They were really the, the two safety aspects of the Triumph Herald. Um, it didn't have a shoulder strap. They weren't inertia seat belts. They, they weren't on the pulley system at all. And also you have to bear in mind that back in the early 70s, seat belts were optional anyway. You didn't have to wear them. OK, there were no seat belts in the back of the car and seat belts were, were entirely optional. If you compare that to a modern vehicle where we've got airbags, where we've got um, uh, braking systems that will stop you crashing. We've got the uh, side impact protection systems. We've got all these different safety features. We've got uh, lane, uh, lane drift avoidance, all these kinds of things that are coming in. We simply didn't have the or. Um, I'm saying we didn't have the need. We certainly didn't have the awareness or the expectation that the car could do anything to help us with that. The diagram on the right hand side is an interesting one because I was at um, an automotive company in Italy at the end of last year. Um, and if you can see on, on the diagram, the headlights look like they're shining something onto the pavement. That's a real thing. And the headlights themselves are so complex that what they would do is monitor so look for people standing at the side of the road, stop the vehicle and then project a zebra crossing onto the road and tell the people to cross the road in front of the car. Now, I can't think of many more things that would terrify me. Um, if, if a car stopped in front of me and projected a zebra crossing and asked me to cross, I'd be thinking of that old uh, Stephen King film, uh, The Duel, and I would essentially soil myself, but that's, uh, that's me. Um, so if we look at the safety features, that there's many, many, many more of them and they're orders of magnitude more complex. And that's just the safety. Look at the other things as well. Look at the security features. Look at the environmental constraints that we now have. Look at the push towards things like um, hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles that we have that, we, that, that was undreamt of, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, certainly 50 years ago. Now, coming back to um, one of the points that Simon was making is previously the, the interface between the outside world and my system and my car was me. If I was driving the car, I was basically the interface to the outside world. I would interface to the car through the steering wheel, uh, the gear stick and the three pedals. 
but actually the interaction with the outside world was entirely down to me and my senses okay because i was actually you know i, I was an inherent part of the system but i controlled the the communications with the outside world what we're starting to see now though is the car is now truly part of a wider system of systems Okay, we consider something like the, the UK, as we're based in the UK, the UK road network. And if you now consider the modern car, that's now, yes, it's connecting with GPS, but it's also, um, it's also connecting with other vehicles. It's connecting with uh, other transport systems as well, such as the train. It's connecting with different things in the city, with smart cities, it's detecting other road users such as pedestrians and so on. So the car, yes, it is a system in its own right, but it's now part of a, a far wider system of systems. In this case, the UK transport network. And as we start to see this shift towards a very natural um, uh, system of systems, because we're living in an increasingly connected world, so we're starting to see the responsibility shift away from me as a person, as the driver, and onto the vehicle itself. So that's going to bring with it its own increase in complexity. Uh, so Simon, any points to make here? Um, not, not specifically. You know, I, I don't want to sort of preempt what we might talk about in the, uh, the social net in the next session, but um, not, not even not sort of directly related to this presentation particularly, but for me, one of the biggest challenges in systems engineering going forward is this increasing level of complexity. Um, I said in the conversation I had with somebody yesterday that if we don't know how to build a plane or a train or a car by now, you know, let's just give up. But the kind of challenges of these smart cities and I, I think is where a lot of the interest lies and, and applying I, th I think automotive, for example, and smart cities are, will force us as systems engineers to really start paying attention to an increasingly interconnected world and something that we need to start addressing. I mean, the current world situation with the virus is an exact example of that, you know, that systems thinking just has, you know, needs to start being applied at a sort of social, the social side of the socio-technical um, side of systems engineering and i think this increased connectivity of systems of systems is actually forcing us now to seriously start doing that okay all right thanks sir. well let's move on then so the other thing that we're starting to see and this is this is a particularly interesting one is it's not necessarily an increase in complexity it's complexity shift okay um so the, the middle of last year i uh, bought as part of my midlife crisis i bought an electric motorbike okay which is essentially it's like a it, it, it looks like a lambretta essentially it's that kind of thing it's the equivalent of a 50 feet uh, 50 cc uh, motorbike and um it's if you look at the the parts on it it's basically it's got a motor on the back wheel it's got a battery it's got a controller in the in in the uh, handlebar grip and it's got software and that's it OK, if you compare an electric vehicle now with um, a, a, a typical, a classic sort of a internal combustion engine driven vehicle and you look at the complexity of a combustion engine compared to an electric motor, there's no comparison. OK, if, if you look at the Triumph Herald from 1970, the entire complexity of that engine is mechanical and a slight bit of electrical thrown in. If you compare that to an electric motor today, there's almost no mechanical complexity in that electric motor. There's only one moving part, and that's the thing that rotates, that actually drives the vehicle. Where the complexity lies in something like the uh, electric car or my electric motorbike is in the software that controls it. If we go back to the Triumph Herald from 1970, there was literally no software in it. So the, the, the mechanical complexity was high, the software complexity was zero. If we look at a modern um, a, a modern motor now, the mechanical complexity is very, very low, but the software complexity is very, very high. So what we're also starting to see, rather than just saying it's an increase in complexity, we're starting to see a shift 
in complexity, away from our traditional sort of mechanical, electromechanical systems, and into things like software and more electronic controls, smart sensors, these incredibly powerful smart headlights that we've just been talking about. So it's also a shift in the complexity. And so when people when we talk about how complex a system is, one of the things that we really need to be saying is rather than how complex is the system, is where does the complexity live in our system? Because that's where things are more likely to go wrong. And one of the things that we, we might very well discuss in the uh, in the social event afterwards is actually the where the complexity lives in the system and identifying the complexity in the system is very much dependent on viewpoints, is very much context dependent because different stakeholders will look at the system and they'll view the complexity in different ways. They'll identify where the complexity lives in different ways. Now, anybody that's dealt with this before will probably know what's coming next when I talk about the shape of complexity. Um, one of the things we have to remember about complexity is that it does evolve over, over time and it has a shape. OK, and the shape of this complexity conforms to what we uh, we know as the Brontosaurus theory. OK, so this is the Brontosaurus of complexity. It's not just your ordinary Brontosaurus. It's a very special sort of Brontosaurus. So the idea is that the um, the magnitude of complexity in the system is analogous to the thickness of the brontosaurus at any point in time. And as we probably all know, according to the brontosaurus theory, a brontosaurus is very thin at one end. Let me see if I can use my uh, my laser pointer at this point. Laser point. There we go. It's very, very thin at one end. It gets much, much thicker in the middle. And then it's very thin again at the other end. And complexity mirrors that. OK, complexity is 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 like that. So if you consider. Well, that's supposed to be a human eye. That's an eye looking at. The smiley face of the Brontosaurus, OK, if you consider when we begin a project and we might just have an initial set of uh, uh, needs or requirements and there might be text based and it might be done uh, as a list, for example, what we start to see is as we look into the face of the Brontosaurus, the complexity is actually quite low. The magnitude of the complexity is quite low and we feel quite good about this and we feel happy. So we smile and the Brontosaurus smiles back at us um, and the world's a happy place because what we're looking at here is essentially A, B and C. We're seeing three things listed and we're not seeing the relationships between them. So then what happens is based on this very simple view of the system, we go and do our cost time and resource estimates. But something interesting then happens because if we start to apply our systems engineering, if we start to apply our modeling and we start to scratch the surface is we start to go down the neck of the Brontosaurus and the complexity starts to increase and it starts to increase more. So we start to look at things like uh, do stakeholder analysis and look at use cases and look at scenarios and the complexity increases. We start to look at candidate solutions, different uh, trade offs, the complexity increases and it increases and increases until we're at this point here which is what we refer to as the belly of the brontosaurus. OK, and the belly of the brontosaurus is not a good place to be. That's the point where you go into a room and there's a diagram that's as big as a wall. Everybody's using different notations. Everybody's using different tools. People are using different versions of the same tools that are incompatible. Uh, some people are using PowerPoint. Some people are using modeling tools. Some people are just using text. Um, things get tricky, so the project managers leave the project. Uh, all the contractors get up and leave and go and work for another organization. And the whole thing is in chaos. And it's very, very frustrating because you've actually done the right thing. You've started at the smiley face and you started to apply the modeling techniques. You've started to imply the, apply the systems engineering techniques, yet the complexity has increased as, as we've gone through. And this is a very natural thing to happen, is that we're starting to identify complexity that we simply didn't know existed before. And that's one of the key things. It's not we're introducing complexity, it's we're starting to identify complexity that we simply didn't know existed. But then something interesting happens, because if we continue with our modelling, if we continue to apply our good best practice systems engineering, we hit a point where the complexity actually starts to decrease. And it goes down and down and down until we get to this point here, which is the tail of the Brontosaurus. And what we have 
at this point is a concise, elegant solution to the problem that we had up here that's easy to communicate with people, that's as simple as it needs to be and no more so, where we can identify where the complexity lives and that we can get our, our, all of our stakeholders, we can communicate this to them and that they can understand it. And that's what we're looking at doing, okay? Unfortunately, when we start at the, at this point, we can't go directly to the tail without traveling through the whole body and the belly and the tail beforehand. It's just impossible. We will always start to identify complexity, no matter how simple we thought the thing was in the first place. And we have to accept that. We have to accept that we will identify complexity. The perception of complexity will increase before it will start to decrease. Um, you know, my entire career and Simon's has been in model based systems engineering, and this still happens on every single project that we work on today is that the complexity will increase before we get to our optimal point, which is the tail of the Brontosaurus. However, it's not all bad news because there's, um, when we talk about model based systems engineering, it will allow us to do certain things. Very importantly, it will allow us to identify complexity regardless of where it lives in the system. Okay, We can start to apply things like complexity measures. These can be relatively simple, like simply counting the number of uh, graphic nodes on a, or blocks, if you like, if you were using SysML on a diagram, the number of operations, the number of properties and so on, and cal calculating ratios. We can apply things like McCabe cyclomatic, cyclomatic complexity if we want to. There's all different types of complexity measures that we can apply to our models that will give us an indication of where the complexity lives. Um, it's very important that we do this at different levels of abstraction as well, at the highest level, at the medium levels and at the lowest levels. So for all complexity, when we start to apply model based systems engineering, it will allow us to identify that complexity and also to measure that complexity in whatever way we want to. When we talk about essential complexity that lies in the heart of the system, what we're really talking about there is controlling and managing that complexity. So we might be minimizing the dependencies, for example, between different system elements, uh, controlling our interfaces and controlling the number of interactions across those interfaces. So rather than trying to actually reduce the complexity, we're trying to control it to make sure that we're not depending on any of these very complex areas. When it comes to things like accidental complexity that is our fault, then we certainly can start to do something about that. We can start to rationalise it. We can start to take steps to reduce it. There's different modelling techniques that we can apply. We can apply principles of, of abstraction and decomposition and make sure we've got good partitions in there that will help us to control that complexity. And we can reduce things like the number of nodes, but very importantly, the number of links between these different nodes that we might have. When it comes to the Brontosaurus, and I did say things will always get worse before they get better. And again, rather than seeing that as a pure negative, you've got to look at actually what can we do about that? And when we talk about MBSE, it will help us flatten and shorten the Brontosaurus. OK, if we have a good MBSE approach in place. So we've got defined frameworks. So ontologies and viewpoints, which uh, we'll be talking about in subsequent um, presentations. That's going to help us make sure that the Brontosaurus is as slim as possible. Having good process sets in place that actually meet our original uh, 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 purpose and that work well with our frameworks. So you can think of the frameworks as the information that we're producing and the process sets are telling us how we produce that information or how we manipulate that information. So having a good approach in place is essential to flattening and shortening the Brontosaurus. Also having good visualization techniques. So applying good notations, things like SysML, most of us have probably uh, come across before, things like U, um, UML, BPMN, formal methods, doesn't matter what they are. There can be any number of different notations, but having good visualization is key to model-based systems engineering, and it's key to flattening the Brontosaurus. 
being able to demonstrate compliance as well, being able to having the confidence that we can talk to different stakeholders and demonstrate that what we produce is compliant with best practice, for example. Uh, we can demonstrate it's fit for purpose. We can demonstrate it meets all the different constraints we were talking about earlier, the safety, the security, the environmental constraints and so on. And also having tools in place, but not just any tools, having what we call sharp tools in place, okay? Having tools in place that will enable our approach, that will make sure that the people that we have in place can work to their best of abilities. Above all, when we talk about MBSE, we want to produce the model. So think of the model as the single source of truth. So all the information, all the knowledge, all the data associated with our system in a single conceptual uh, 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 location, that's what we mean by the model. It needs to be robust, it needs to be rigorous, it needs to be complete and it needs to be communicable, okay? These four things we've got here, robust, rigorous, complete and communicable, it needs to be have enough of a level of these to meet the stakeholder needs. People will argue a model can never be complete because a model is a simplification of reality. Yes, but it can be complete enough for our needs. You know, we can always make things more rigorous. But again, if we have a good, clear understanding of our needs, we know the level of rigour that we need. We know the level of robustness. We know the level of completeness. We know what and who the stakeholders are. So we know how that we've got to communicate with, the, with these different stakeholders. So when we talk about complexity, complexity will manifest itself in all systems, regardless of how simple we think they are. As time has gone on, complexity has evolved in terms of the system elements. So we're now looking at things like electronics and software and just you know, not just the sheer number of system elements, but the nature of them has changed. And because things like electronics and software depend on actually interacting with other things, on monitoring, on controlling other system elements, the complexity has naturally increased. We've seen an increase in the constraints. Think about the stakeholders, whether they're end users, whether they're standards, whether they're maintainers, whether it's us as the engineers and the managers, our expectations have increased as time has gone on. Stakeholders now expect better quality. They expect things to be more reliable, more available, more maintainable, more safe, and so on. So the constraints have increased dramatically over the last few decades. We've also seen that we now live in a truly connected world and that this has had its impact on the system because now our systems, all of our systems are now connected and they become part of a truly a part of a wider system of systems okay not just a collection of interaction interacting systems but truly a system of systems that's achieving something that none of the individual systems can achieve by themselves and we're also seeing this complexity shift away from things like mechanical and electrical complexity into things like software type complexity so these are some of the factors that we have to bear in mind when we talk about um, when we talk about complexity when we talk about model-based systems engineering, it will allow us to identify and manage this complexity. And that is one of the key benefits that MBAC is bringing to the table, is allowing us to cope with this complexity in some way. And as complexity goes on, as it evolves, as it increases, as it shifts, as our perception of these systems uh, shift, so that the techniques that we apply need to be more rigorous, more, more robust, allow us to, to create complete models and so on. And that's where model-based systems engineering comes in. So that's really the, the formal end of the, um, of the presentation today. Um, if everybody's self-isolating and staying indoors, you could do a lot worse than read lots of books and Christmas is never too far away. So um, obviously buy all of them. If you've liked today, uh, we will be doing this every Thursday. If people have got any suggestions for what they want us to talk about in presentations, please do get in contact. We've got regular training courses that we will be running one day courses uh, each week um, for the next coming months. We'll have a free talk every Thursday, such as this one, and we'll be following that up with the model based social event. Um, go to our website for more details or follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn information and I think as many of you know
On Fridays, we do our SysML based quiz, SysML and ERI, uh, which people are welcome to uh, uh, join in on. Um, that's really the end of this presentation. We've got time for a couple of quick questions. Otherwise, after a 15 minute break, we'll be uh, starting up the model based social event. So, uh, Simon, anything to add? Uh, I don't think so, John. No. Um, uh, the, um, the the social events are, are, are separate meeting, um, so I'll. Um, some of you have already been invited. Um, I'll, I'll post the link up. Now. Um, Can you put the link on this um, somehow as a message, or probably yes. One second. Hopefully that thing at the bottom. <laughs> 